Happy Valentine's Day, and welcome again to the front room of our home. Sophia and I hope you're enjoying a quiet, relaxing evening. Tonight, in honor of St. Valentine himself, we are playing some of the most romantic pieces we know. While we musicians might really have a lot of fun arguing about just why and what makes a piece of music romantic, oh, it's all about the subject and plot. No, you dilettante, it's all compositional technique and style. No, you metronome head, it's just sheer melodic beauty and nothing else. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a great evening to me. But for the rest of us, we may not be able to exactly put our finger on what makes something romantic, but just like love, we know it when we feel it. And I think, ultimately, that's what romantic music is really all about. So pop open some champagne, and here's a toast to love and music. Our first romantic piece of the night is Tchaikovsky's Overture Fantasy, Romeo and Juliet. No, it's not one of Tchaikovsky's ballets, and no, it wasn't written for the play. This is what we call a standalone descriptive piece, or if you want to get really fancy, a proto-symphonic poem. You see, Tchaikovsky had to deal with all those questions about what makes something romantic, too. Plus, he was trying to come up with a style and sound all his own that he was comfortable composing in. Was he going to go full Russian? Or maybe French? Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Maybe German? Balakirev and the nationalist composers were pushing hard for pure Russian music with all its exotic flair. All the Russian nobility was deeply entrenched in all things French, and all of high society was fluent in the French language. And lastly, just like in England, Tsaritsa Yekaterina and the Russian royals themselves were Germans, not Russians at all. Now, I'm an American, but personally, I think Tchaikovsky did a masterful job of creating a Russian style that was neither this nor that but a true balance of all the cultural complexities that made up Mother Russia at that point in history. So here is Romeo and Juliet, Tchaikovsky's first successful attempt at a Russian style. It's a precursor of his French ballet style with German-style chorale settings based on the ultimate English love story about two immortal star-crossed Italian lovers and their rival families, all made into something so uniquely Russian that even the Viking descendants themselves are convinced that this music was written in their very DNA. Here is the story of Romeo and Juliet in music. The hymn type of music you hear is just that, the music of the church and the friar, who secretly helps and marries Romeo and Juliet. The most obvious music is the fight music between the Montagues and the Capulets. The romantic themes are where Romeo and Juliet fall in love and later get married. And then, of course, there is the final ominous scene where they embrace for all eternity.
One of the most intimate forms of music ever devised is the quartet. Four musicians, and only four, come together to work in perfect balance and harmony. The world that they live in for the time they are playing is created by the composer. The musicians are at the mercy of the composer, and the composer is certainly at the mercy of the musicians. This is a relationship of pure aesthetics and elegance. Nothing can be out of place, nothing can be out of balance, or the whole thing just falls apart. If you had to compare it to something in the art painting world, the quartet would be a still life. For the athletes among you, this is true figure skating, not the flashy freestyle stuff with the music, but figure skating in silence, where the skater traces a figure onto the ice and then perfectly retraces that figure a second time. Following the created lines is considered the purest test of a skater's technique. This is one of Sophia's quartets here tonight. Ordinarily, we'd have a string quartet come in, but since that's just not possible right now, Sophia has set this piece for our two pianos. Each of our hands will be a different instrument. My left hand here is the cello. My right will be the viola. Sophia will take the two violins. This is intimacy, elegance, harmony, and balance at its finest. In other words, all the things that are absolutely vital for romance and love to work.
Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty? Or is it THE Sleeping Beauty? Actually, both are correct. If you say in English, use THE. The fairy tale title contains THE, but the Russian language doesn't have the words A and THE. And yep, same problem with Nutcracker versus THE Nutcracker. Regardless of the title, if Romeo and Juliet was the beginning of Tchaikovsky's romantic style, then Sleeping Beauty was the pinnacle. This was Tchaikovsky's last and greatest ballet. Now, don't get your stories confused. This is not the one with Sleepy, Dopey, and Grumpy. This is the other one with the spinning wheel and the spindle. Short version, Evil Fairy tries to kill Princess Aurora at her christening party by having her die of a finger prick on her 16th birthday. Good Fairy saves the day by mitigating the spell. She will only fall into unending sleep instead. The rest of the kingdom joins her in her slumber. Prince Desiree arrives 100 years later to save the day with a kiss. Here's your trivia for the Russian version of this story. Prince Desiree beats out Prince Charming. And also, Puss in Boots makes an appearance as well, as well as Little Red Riding Hood, and Cinderella, and even Beauty and the Beast. At any rate, this is the famous waltz where the entire kingdom is dancing at Princess Aurora's 16th birthday party.
If ever there was a theme that should just be called a love theme, it's this one. It's one of the most recognized melodies in the world. Rachmaninoff's Paganini Variation number 18, Opus 43. This is one of those melodies that just is. There's no rhyme or reason for it. There's no story behind it. It's just one of many incredible variations in the set. But when it starts, for some reason or other, nothing says love better. Nothing will touch your heart quite like this melody. There's a reason it's so famous. From Sophia and myself, here's wishing you and yours a very happy Valentine's Day. Don't ever forget to cherish those you love.